Good morning, everyone. It still is morning, and I appreciate your attention for just a couple of minutes before we bring on our distinguished chief investment officers from uh, both Guggenheim and Franklin Templeton. Um, I just want to set the stage here just a little bit and talk a little bit about where we think at Bloomberg Intelligence we are. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, as you know, is, uh, um, is Bloomberg's answer to sell-side research, and we have uh, it, we, we cover a variety of sectors and markets across the world. Um, so first, let me start with our view on where the economy is and where the economy is going. Uh, so first, we do think that the economy is heading into a very significant slowdown, if not recession, uh, over the next six to nine months. Um, in fact, there are some indicators, such as uh, ISM new orders and some of uh, the conference board leading indicators that are already pointing toward a recession. And in fact, oftentimes over the last 50 years, when we've reached these kind of levels, the Federal Reserve would have already been cutting interest rates. But obviously, because of the uh, inflationary environment, the Federal Reserve has been loath to do that, and in fact, may next week even hike once again. Um, <clears throat> talking about inflation, obviously, we've seen, uh, I can't call it unprecedented. I know there are people who are saying that inflation has been very high. Uh, but over the last century of, uh, of inflation data, as you can see, um, there is less moderation of inflation than we've seen uh, in recent years. Um, inflation has peaked, and our view is that we will continue to see modest um, continued slowdown in the inflationary environment. But inflation is still going to remain well above the Federal Reserve's comfort levels over the next, uh, next year or so. And that will mean that the Federal Reserve, in our view, uh, will be very reluctant to cut interest rates, and uh, at least as quickly as the market is currently priced. Uh, looking at the, the job market, we obviously had some reasonably decent data from, uh, from the jobs market just last week. Um, the jobs market is usually a lagging indicator, but in an environment where service sector prices continue to be one of the uh, large drivers of the inflationary impulse that we've seen over the past uh, 18 months or so, um, the job market is, winds up being key and, and, and the tightness of the labor market continues to be a key driver of inflation, and that's something that we'll obviously hit on um, in our discussion. Uh, finally, you know, the Federal Reserve does think that this year will be the end of interest rate increases. Um, that seems very likely. Uh, we'll get a new dot plot next week uh, during their June meeting. Um, but the dot plot right now, and, and this is something that we'd like to hit on in our next panel, where we talk about where is the terminal floor. We had talked about the terminal rate for interest rate hikes on the upside. Now we're going to have to talk about how low they can get. The Federal Reserve believes that that long-term uh, uh, terminal rate is probably down at 2.5%. And in fact, if you look at um, uh, the, the market and what the market's pricing, it might be somewhere down there as well. Near term or tactically, we now are pricing for a skip and then an interest rate increase in July and then interest rate cuts starting by the end of the year. Um, all of these charts, by the way, you can find on the Bloomberg Terminal. And in fact, this is the WIRP function that you can find where um, the market is currently pricing the probabilities of uh, short-term interest rates and, and the Fed Fund's effective rate. Um, when we look at the terminal floor for Fed Funds, how low will they get? Um, our view is, is that the, the Federal Reserve will wind up cutting in the next cycle down to about 2%, so a little bit below what the Federal Reserve says is the long-term average, but the market is still closer to 3%. And that's something that I'd like to discuss with our uh, next panelist as they, uh, when they come up in just a moment. Um, finally, let's talk a little bit about foreign flows and foreign demand for US Treasuries. There's been a lot of talk about, um, about significant demand from overseas. Uh, there has been some shifts in some of, the, uh, some of the demand profiles from foreign investors over the last couple of uh, years. Um, and in fact, I think it's important to, to recognize that, yes, central banks are large buyers and are large holders of Treasury securities, but it's really private investors that are driving a lot of the demand. And foreign investors, uh, private investors, tend to invest in longer duration, longer maturity, more risk assets, um, and, uh, and, and Treasuries in particular, whereas central banks and, uh, and FX reserve managers tend to stay very liquid and in short-term securities. So call it three-year notes, two-year notes, and, and treasury bills and, and the like. So when you see that foreign flows are maybe falling a little bit, you still have to pay attention to who is actually buying. Is it the private investors that are buying long-duration assets 
um, and, and a lot more risk, or is it central banks and official foreign flows? And I'm going to skip this one and go to here because we had an extra chart here. Um, so when, and when we look at foreign flows and foreign holders of treasuries, foreigners have actually not been huge buyers of treasury securities over the past five years. Um, and in fact, you've actually seen a significant um, drawdown of treasury security holdings by official institutions as central banks have been defending their currency as the dollars increased in value. But private investors have picked up some of that demand as treasury, as treasury yields have risen.